All right, in today's episode, we're going to talk about six weird ways that you can lose weight. These are behaviors you could do that typically result in fat loss. Doug, are you going to really let him title it that? Why yeah, not? why not? Because yeah. nobody no. who who searches the internet and goes, "That's what I want to how I want to learn." You know, <laughs> nobody's going to. I'm gonna attracted listen. to it. Hey, it says weird. In nobody's going to listen to this episode. Like, hey, you know what? I want an unconventional way of losing weight. You know why? <laughs> it reminds me of a, it reminds me of like email spam that'll get uh, you. Like, you know, th this weird way to make money or whatever. Yeah. Click on it. I mean, no, simply I mean, changing I mean, best for weird or, or well, like, they're not so creative. They're, or yeah, weird so is going to turn people. Off. We could come up with different mm. different titles. Actually, but. weird in marketing is a pretty good word. Oh, is it really? Exactly. Yes, yeah. that's a that's a true story. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, Doug's really that confident, so he knows. What I see, he's about. saying it he's confident. On it. He's saying it confidently. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a time where I was sold on like an article that said like try these three weird things in the bedroom. You yeah, know what well, I'm um, mm, I don't that know. for sure people are clicking. <laughs> yeah, dude. Are you just, you just came up with a viral title. Yeah, that actually is better than that title. No, you know, okay, so they're weird because they're not, you know, people Conventional. Don't, yeah, they don't think of, yeah. like, okay, first off, when it comes to losing body fat, um, you have to consume less calories than you take in. So all the strategies revolve around that, right? Speeding up the metabolism or doing more activity to burn more calories or just cutting calories. But really, one of the, one of the things that we encountered as trainers was it was always really challenging when you would tell clients uh, to just eat less and move more because it was almost like this, uh, it, it would turn into this rebellion or mm -hmm. this white knuckling. It didn't, it was hard to uh, to turn into behaviors because it was almost like, God, I got to just count these calories and I can't eat more and I got to move more type of deal. So, you know, as trainers, and I know you guys found, uh, you know, lots of ways of getting the client to get there yeah. without feeling like they're restricting well, I know before, uh, Adam, you've made the point that it parallels a lot of parenting. And for <laughs> me, it's always been like trying to get like certain nutrients uh, for my kids to eat was always a challenge. So you'd find like recipes or different ways to disguise it or, you know, unique uh, deliveries uh, to, to be able to kind of get them to buy into to eating it. Well, th I also think this episode speaks to the psychology of training a client. Totally. Right. So what we learned over decades of training people was, yeah, you're, to your point, obviously law of thermodynamics still applies. If you eat less uh, than you burn, you're going to lose weight. I mean, that's just, that's a fact. But what happens is people get so fixated on counting the calories and counting their, their whatever tool they're using to check their burn that they get fixated on that and then they end up falling off the wagon and then it turns into this weird it's relationship like a stressful relationship yeah it turns into this weird relationship of uh it's rest it's restrictive and then they end up wanting to rebel against this thing and it's like so as a coach how can i find ways to trick my client into changing behavior other behaviors outside of the basic counting calories and burning calories to result in that math right, right and right. so that's really what this is about is these are things, these are very practical, simple tactics that you can add into your life that doesn't feel restrictive. It doesn't feel like you're telling yourself you can't eat less calories and you have to move more. But what we know is that inevitably will create that calorie deficit yes. through other means. In other words, these are ways that lead to those behaviors without feeling restrictive or controlled, or at least a much lower risk of those things. Today's YouTube giveaway is MAPS Power Lift. Here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. Also, this month's workout program sale, MAPS Anabolic is half off. And MAPS Anabolic Advanced, also half off. Both are most popular muscle building programs. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. So yeah, the first option- adherence. Yeah, so the first option, I'll pose like this, okay? So the first, the, not option, the first uh, thing we're going to say is eating without distractions. Okay, so imagine this. Imagine a scenario where I take a client and I say to them, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have you eat 10% less calories a day. Let's start right there. We're going to take your calories and we're going to cut 10%. So we're going to cut whatever you're eating, 200 calories out of your diet. Or option two, I say, don't change anything about your diet. But when you eat, don't be on your phone. Don't watch TV. Don't be on your computer. 
Don't be reading a magazine. Just pay attention to what you're doing with your food. Eat it mindfully. Watch everything that goes into your yeah. mouth. Literally just be mindful while you eat. Which one of those is going to feel more restrictive, right? Which one of those is feels more controlled? Yeah, the one that's telling you can't have that's a certain right. amount of calories. But, and now studies consistently show that mindful eating reduces your caloric intake by about 10%. Both of them resulting in the same effect, behavior change, but one of them is a, a is more likely to stick around. So it's just a good practice where you're not you know, hyper fixated on cutting your calories. You're just like, well... My trainer said, eat whatever I want. Just kind of be not distracted. Let's see what happens. And it works. It definitely works. Yeah. I think this is just, is this is purely like an awareness tool. 100%. Um, this was something that we used to tell our clients uh, even before the adoption of the iPhone, right? So I was a trainer before the first iPhone came out and I still <clears throat> use this tactic with like eating in front of, and it was, and it wasn't because I had even seen the research because I don't think the research came out till later. Uh, that you're referring mm -hmm. to uh, around the 10% less calories. It was just from pure observation and my own behaviors. I'd noticed yeah. that, you know, I, I crave certain foods when I watched movies or if I sat in front of the television and I started to eat, I would eat more than what I normally would if I sat at a, dim a formal dinner table totally. and just ate and was present with my family or friends that we were sitting with. And so that became just something that we would tell clients. And then later on, you see the research and the support to support the point you're making. And then you see the adoption of the cell phone, which I think just it just exacerbated it. It made it totally. it made it worse because now you have this portable television yep. anywhere you go. It used to be I used to tell clients that you know because people would do that like around dinner time or whatever that they would have this habit. Now we have this habit at any time we're alone. We pull all this, day long. We pull this thing out. Yeah, yeah. and uh, one thing I found a lot of times too was uh, when they would travel. Back and forth, and like when they're um, when they stop at the gas station or they stop somewhere as a convenience store, and then they're driving and eating at the same time, distracted. You know, all those calories were adding in there that they didn't even like account for. Uh, and you know, the, to be able to even just slow down and eat with intention itself is something that um, you know has a massive. You, you disconnect from your body signals when you're uh, paying attention to something else, so you're going to receive the satisfaction signal later than you would if you were being mindful. And that, again, has been consistently shown to result in about 10% more. It's not a massive calorie cut, but it's a 10% across the board. Like studies will show between four to six pounds of weight loss in 12 weeks where people are told not to change anything just to do mindful eating. You know, Justin, you just brought up something too that I think does fall into this category and it's not one of the other points that we're making up. So I think we should expand on it a little bit, which is that because it's considered still a distraction, which is uh, the kind of just grabbing for nuts while you're doing other things. It's all distracted or, eating. Yeah, yeah, it's all distracted eating. And so what would fall in this category too, aside from avoiding being in front of the television or being mm -hmm. in front of your phone while you're doing this is, is also just eating at set meal times, right? So if you're yes. hungry, yeah. sit down and have a full meal. Don't go grab a snack right. to hold you over until this next meal while you're still yeah, doing chips, work or, or doing something, something else. Loose. Yeah. You know, if you're hungry, go eat, mm -hmm. but but make that a meal time, and then actually prepare a full meal. Sit down without the phones, without the computers, without the other distractions, and eat your meal. Just simply keeping yourself in that, and not over fixating on what is it I'm eating, how much of it am I eating, am I weighing this? Might like just do that, and it's amazing uh, how much more aware you become of what you're consuming, and how that just organically reduces the total calorie totally. intake. Totally. All right, next up, this one sounds not connected, but it is a compelling connection, which is you want to lose weight, get better sleep. And I, I know people might be listening, but uh, what do you mean move less? No, uh, it strongly affects behaviors. In fact, I pull up, I pulled up a meta analysis of 20 studies. One of them included 300,000 people, and it found a 41% increased obesity risk among adults who slept fewer than seven hours a night. In other words, people who got less than ideal sleep had a 41% increased risk of obesity. It changes your behaviors. It changes your cravings. Mm -hmm. It makes you eat. If you sleep well, you're less likely to numb yourself or to reach for food to feel better. You're less likely to overeat. This is something that uh, took me a while to make this connection. But this connection is so strong that I can't recall the last time that I felt a strong craving for a type of a food and it I didn't also have poor sleep the night yeah, before. Yeah. 
almost always when I have this, and it took me a while to to make that connection. Go like, oh, I'm having this weird craving, and then think, oh, how did I sleep? Oh shit, it was one of those. And why this is so important to make this connection, if this is you, because I feel like this is a lot of people, is when you know that you had the poor night's sleep and you know that you're probably going to have a, cra a craving ahead of time, it's easier to fight that too. So aside from, okay, I'm going to prioritize my sleep this this night, so I do it. Even if I if there for some reason you know, my, uh -oh. my sleep got mm -hmm. disrupted, I know to be on guard. Like, yeah. hey, the today is going to be a day. I'm going to be craving. And just knowing that is a powerful tool. It, yeah. Knowing that because I didn't get good sleep, there's going to come a time today where I'm going to want something weird like Jack in the Box tacos. I haven't thought about that <laughs> since I was 22 <laughs> years old. Like, so, you know, yeah. Seriously, though, like, yep. if, if I have these weird, odd cravings for junk-type foods, it's always been correlated there's, with a bad night of sleep. There's a lot of reasons why this makes a big difference. One of them is uh, optimal sleep is more likely to produce a hormone profile that's healthy. Hormones definitely play a role in how you store body fat or how much body fat you store. It also, of course, they have they play a role in driving behaviors and cravings. It changes catecholamine uh, production. It affects, sleep can affect serotonin and dopamine. And so studies across the board show that people crave hyper palatable foods when their sleep isn't as good versus when it is really good. In other words, they're seeking something that makes them feel uh, better. Now, evolutionarily speaking, this also makes sense because stress for most of human history really boiled down to one thing, danger or lack of food. And so if you're not getting sleep, that stress on the body, your body's probably like, you're having a tough time finding food. Let's ramp up these hunger signals and give you the drive to keep searching to eat more food. And when you find it, you're going to eat more of it because maybe there's not enough uh, to be around. So this one right here, like when I look at the data on this and I'm working and I'm, I'm working with someone who wants to lose a lot of weight, I know the behaviors around changing their diet are really hard. Changing behaviors to improve sleep are easier, mm -hmm. but they will result in better eating habits. So this is a really good one to tackle. I, and, and we're talking about eating habits right now and how this is in control, uh, making better food choices. But this also plays a huge role too in your likelihood to go to the gym and work out too. Of course. Yeah. Like when I get a good night's rest and I come, I get up out of bed and I feel refreshed and ready to start You're gonna my day. You're going to perform already, way better. I'm already, I'm going to be more productive at work. I'm more likely to just move neat more mm -hmm. because, because of that. And then I'm more likely to show up for my workout that day too. So it has this other compounding effect outside of just hormonally and nutritionally the choices that you make. It also makes a difference in, I think, your total total neat for the day and movement and productivity, and then also your likelihood that you're going to go to the gym and have a good workout. Right. Speaking of, of neat or, or movement, um, the next one is to walk after meals. It doesn't have to be a lot. It'd be five to 10 minutes. You can literally eat and then <clears throat> walk around your office or go outside and walk around the block. Now, why does this make a difference. Well, it's extra activity. So if you do 10 minutes of walking three times a day, it's 30 minutes of walking you weren't doing before, but that's not real. The, that's not really the major impact. The major impact is how it affects your blood sugar. When you eat food, uh, your blood sugar goes up and contracting and relaxing, relaxing muscles really sends a signal to suck up those carbohydrates, that glycogen. And you see these, these great effects on blood sugar levels mm -hmm. that affects your behaviors rises and drops in blood sugar um, make you want to eat more food. They make you not feel so good or feel anxious. So walking after meal, by the way, walking after meals also improves digestion, yes. which also affects your big uh, time. Behaviors. I mean, if you're, you know, you're getting your blood flow, like you're getting movement. Um, you, I mean, your food needs to move. It needs to travel. It needs to get to the you're right. upright also. Digest the yeah. process. Yeah. You, I mean, yes, you can rely on gravity, but like to be able to add that bit of movement uh, so you do get contraction, you do get like some help there with your tissues to kind of help move everything along. Um, and then you're more likely to also get better sleep, uh, which is something yeah. that I found, especially for like dinner and to walk after a dinner was enormously helpful because uh, one of the biggest problems I'd have, I go, go and then lay down and, you know, and then my food didn't properly digest. And then that would wake me up in the middle of the night. This, to me, this has also been, if you've, if you've listened to the show long enough, you've heard me talk about this as a relationship hack too. Um, I found this is just a great time for my wife and I to connect to. It just became a, a ritual for us. Like 
after we ate, you, we would just go for these nice walks. Mm -hmm. And it used to, it started and stemmed from us actually going out to eat because we used to go to our favorite place over in Campbell downtown. It has just this real nice area to walk downtown. And we wouldn't just eat and then get back in the car. Was, we always like to stroll up and down it. And like, we just started to connect the benefits of that. Like just mm -hmm. how we felt after having this big old sushi dinner or whatever, just simply walking for 15 to 20 minutes afterwards, how much better we felt afterwards. And it just became, the, and then we also noticed too, like we're connecting, we're not, we don't have our phones on us. It's just her and I it separated, it, it isolated this time where we could have this one-on-one -on -one conversation. It created better digestion. We felt better. We're burning more. It just ended up being this thing. It's like, wow, that's such a small thing that we can add into our life. And we talk so much on the show. I know today we're talking about, you know, calories and how that helps with weight loss, but like the whole health sphere is also relationship and parent and all of the other of things we talk about. And so if anytime I can find a hack that is going to serve me with my fitness goals on maybe my aesthetic goals and how my weight goals or whatever, and then also my relationship goals or other things that are related to health. That's gold. To me, that's those are that's real gold. Totally. And you know, to the digestion point, you know, you have hip flexor muscles that literally run through the digestive system. Yeah. And you contract and move them. They do help massage and uh and, and move things down. And and then the, and then lastly, this is a an activity behavior that is more likely to stick than other activity behaviors. What I mean by that is if you're trying to actively add be activity to your life. One of the most effective ways to do it is to connect activity to something you already do. So you already eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If you add a, a short walk, a seven-minute walk after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're going to effectively add 21 minutes of walking to your day, and it's more likely to stick around than if you were to block off 21 minutes at any other time of the day. Yeah, that's called habit stacking. Yeah. And, there, and there's research to prove the success rate of habit stacking versus trying to create something completely different. Like if you all send aside that I'm going to go on this weight loss journey, part of that weight loss journey, I'm going to add an hour of cardio every single day. And you now have to show up to the gym at a different time than you've mm -hmm. ever been there before or stay there later or it disrupt your day and do that versus, hey, after every meal, I'm going to take a 15 to 20 minute walk meals are already something that you've established as a ritual already in your life and is already a habit. By adding that habit to that habit, you're way more likely to stick to it, which that's so important to this whole game of staying healthy and fit forever is adherence. And so you have to ask yourself, like, which is what we learn to do as coaches is, you know, if you ask a client, like, can you do this? That's the first question. Yes, I can do it. Two, do you see yourself doing this forever? And if their client goes, no, I don't see myself getting up at four o'clock in the morning and going for an hour cardio session every mm -hmm. single day of my life forever, I can't, I just want to do it to get in shape. Well, then we're not going to do that now because yeah, I, I might be able to use that tool to get you there. But if you cannot see yourself doing that forever, then what is the point of me having you do that? You're only going to end up putting the weight back on. 100%. We're far better off finding ways that we can insert it into your habits already and habit stack. And then you're more likely to keep it going forever. Yeah. This next one is somewhat similar to the first one. And it's, to eat without drinking fluids. This does increase the mindfulness around food, but really what it does is it, it, it you, you chew a lot more and you slow way down. Now, I had a really bad habit uh, yeah. for years with food, especially because I trained lots of clients back to back. I would train eight clients or 10 clients in a row in my studio and I'd finish one and two minutes later or five minutes later, another client would show up. And in between those, I would have to eat. And so I had a little little mini kitchenette in the back of my studio and I'd go back there and I'm eating a full meal in five minutes. And so it's like bottle of water, <laughs> food. It's like, you know, chomp, chomp, swallow, chomp, chomp. It's like I was taking supplements. I wasn't even yeah. eating the food. And uh, I didn't realize what the, a negative effect it had on my digestion. I also, when I stopped doing that, and I didn't stop doing it for any of these reasons, I stopped doing it for digestive reasons. I noticed I didn't want to eat nearly as much because I chewed the food, broke yep. it down. By the way, that's that's... That's the very first part of digestion is being able to break it all down. If you can't swallow it without washing it down, yeah. you need to chew on it. You know, have more. to chew a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> I had the same problem. I would like take huge bites and always had to have something to wash it down. If I didn't have something to wash it down, I would choke. And this was just like a, a normal thing for me. I'd choke. Me, oh, I need something to wash it down. Uh, thinking whatever, that was normal. <laughs> Uh, and of course you guys probably think that's, yeah, that makes sense. But, um, <laughs> I, I didn't think anything of it until finally, like 
I forget like when it finally hit me, I was like, man, I need to like <laughs> slow down, take my time. And now it takes me forever to eat, but like I'm, I'm getting better, but just taking that extra amount of time to just <laughs> chew it down to the fine amount has been so much better for everything to process, uh, you know, in my digestion. Did you, now, did you pick up this habit for the same reasons I did where you're trying to go fast? It was a speed class? thing. Yeah. yeah. It, I think it was too, like, you know, you grew Is up with, with siblings. Paul Chick definitely talks about this. Yes, I was just say I think I, I could have sworn that we t we talked about more. Started talking about this more often after we talked to him. yeah Paul Chick. And, and you know, since we're talking about this, I've actually mean I've been meaning to look this up for the longest time. Maybe Doug can look this up for me. Uh, in the '90s, I believe it was the '90s, there was a popular diet that all it was was that you had to chew your food a certain amount of times yeah. before you swallowed yeah. it. I want to say it was like the you know 50, the 50 chews or, or something. It was like, yeah. chew your food 50 times diet. Look for something. And the like whole reason behind it, I know exactly what you're talking about, is because the data shows very clearly if people chew their food well and don't wash it down with fluids, they lose weight. Yeah. They eat less because of it. And well, you know, it's interesting too, is like uh, eating foods that require your jaw strength and, and, oh, you know, yeah. using the masseter and like, um, it, it actually like, it's interesting. And this is where these dumb products come out where you're like just chewing a piece of rubber, uh, to try and build, you know, a more chiseled line. looking face and yeah. jawline, but yeah. like it, it affects your teeth and like, yeah. you know, orthodontics and like, there's a whole, uh, you know, cascade of effects uh, when you don't like really uh, challenge um, the way that you, you know, you, you, you consume food and chew enough. I, I, this is also another, I, I mean, we talk about habit stacking. So here's, this is another one that is so great to pair with the not being distracted, right? If you, if you're not on your phone, you're not on this and you're like really present with your food, you can actually sit here and set. And so I, that's what I would do is I would set a goal of, of counting. Oh, it's either 30 something or 50 something. I can't remember what the number was. hundred percent. There's a book on it. Yes. There was, and a, it was the, the title was the, how many times you yeah, it was, yeah. it was, that was, it was such a silly, I remember as a young trainer thing, this is, yeah, we just dismissed it. Oh, I totally right, dismissed yeah. it as the stupidest thing ever. Hundred percent. And now I, I, I totally recognize the benefits of that now that, cause I've actually done this before i'm like hey i'm not gonna have any fluids and have this dinner and let me tell you having a, a steak rice dinner with no fluids to wash down is is different mm, it's, it, it's different <laughs> and you do you gotta really take your time and chew on every bite before you could swallow that appropriately and you just don't eat as much doing that forget the fact too you're probably burning more calories because you're actually working and chewing more but in, a, in addition to that you just don't eat as much and I yeah think that, i'm bringing it up I'm, I'm trying to look it up myself and it's all saying something like uh 30 times or chew your food more than 30 times yeah okay, i believe I that it was, this is an ayurvedic uh, practice as well. I think Ayurvedic medicine teaches. I knew like, it was like 30 to 50. Or 32 something. times is the number I'm seeing. Okay. There's this guy named Fletcher who was back at the turn of the 20th century and he encouraged everybody to chew their food until it became liquefied, wow. essentially. Oh, so wow. it was called le uh, Fletcherism. Oh, yeah. wow. Well, you know, if you think of this again, I like to go evolutionary, right? If you think of this like you're out, you kill an animal, you're going to eat it. Like you might not have tons of water around. No, you. Well, yeah, no matter what and you you're eating meat, like you're going to chew the hell out of it. Cause guess what happens if you choke, you're yeah, dead. You're right. Done. So <laughs> they probably chewed the hell out of food. And yeah. And yeah. the amount of water the back then was not like water was it so sacred and scarce. That it's like, it's not like you would allow someone to <laughs> pound. Yeah. You probably yeah. had like a, a little you know, canister for the 12 of you, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And so like you get a sip of water, if anything, you probably. know, by the way, this is why they say that modern humans often get their wisdom teeth uh, pulled out because we do so little chewing yeah. ever since we're babies that our jaws don't grow big enough to support no, stay small. Uh, wisdom teeth because yeah, yeah, yeah. it does affect your palate and all that That's stuff. But faster. yeah, this, this one results in weight loss for mm -hmm. many, many people. It's a simple, stupid, it's, it's definitely weird, Adam. Yeah. Next up <laughs> is, <laughs> next up is food order. Food order meaning, hey, don't change your, your diet, but when you make your plate, eat your food in this order. And it goes like this, eat your protein first, eat your fibers next, and then eat your carbohydrates. Now, why would this make a difference, whether I eat protein first or last or whatever? Here's why. Protein and fiber are the most satiety producing of all the macronutrients and components in food. In other words, if you eat your protein and fiber first, you're less likely to overeat. Or to put it differently, you're more likely to eat less calories simply by doing that. This is one of my favorite because almost every client I ever trained had a chip or bread addiction. And that was almost inevitable that they, at one point in our training uh, time they would ask like 
yeah, but Adam, I love bread or I love chips. And my favorite thing to do back to them is be like, I'm not telling you you can't have it, but we just got to make sure we go get your protein first. So that's all I want yes. you to do. So I know the bread's going to come to the table. The yeah. I know the bread's going to come to the table first and the chips are going to come to the table. And I'm not telling you you can't have that bread that you love. All I'm saying is I need you to go get me my 40 grams of protein in that meal first and then have your then have whatever vegetables there. So the, your salad, your green beans or asparagus or whatever it is, and then go have your bread. So, But just get mm -hmm. that for me first. And, you have, and they'd be like, really? I can have my bread? Yes. As long as you go get that 40 grams of protein in that meal first for me, and then you do that, then you absolutely can enjoy yep. the bread. And it always, they report back this, you know, I... You know, I ended up getting to that point. I'm like, I didn't even care. I didn't even want it. Or I could barely I finish. Bites. Yeah, I could barely finish the vegetables after eating the protein. And they're like, I wasn't even hungry anymore. You know what happens is that, it, that when people do the opposite, what, if they do end up leaving anything on their plate, it ends up being the protein. Oh, this, I yeah. mean, I'm guilty of this. Yeah. I'm guilty of, this is why too, I'm, we go to a, you know, we've done this before together. We go to a really fancy steakhouse. It's one of our favorite things to do when we travel is find like the best steakhouse in the area and order appetizers. And it's like- and Then your steak comes. Yeah, and then my you know, $200 yeah. steak comes, I can't finish it. Like nothing, I want to punch myself in the face when that happens. Yeah. And so you know that if you do that, you know your clients are guilty and, and of the, the exact same thing. Right, and then when they do studies on, on diets, same calorie diets, one high protein, one normal protein, the high protein diet results in more fat loss and more muscle gain. So everything controlled, just the protein. Protein encourages muscle growth when you're strength training more than- carbs and fats. It also crushes your appetite in comparison to carbs and fats. Fiber is actually uh, close to protein, but it's second. Um, and it, 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 so it makes you eat less, makes you burn more body fat, makes you build more muscle. So you just eat in this order. And again, it's one of those things where you don't have, you're not telling yourself or no one's telling you to eat less. It's like, look, I don't, whatever you eat, keep eating, just change the order of it and then watch what happens. And it typically results in some slow fat loss. In fact, this became my very first piece of advice to clients towards the end of my career. I didn't do anything else with diet. Typically, I wouldn't even touch diet until we started strength training. But after a certain point, when we got to diet, I would say exactly that. We're not going to change anything. Eat in this order. And everybody would get this like nice gradual fat loss from it. Well, and keep in mind too, all these things that we're talking about, they show positive benefits independently. That's right. So if you actually take all this advice and just go like, listen, we just wrote a diet I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna weigh my food. Yep. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna count a bunch of calories. The only thing that is, that on that requires some sort of tracking here is protein, right? So we're saying like, make sure you hit that food order, and I'd want you to hit your protein intake every day. Other than that, if you stacked all these things, you would see a mat. This is what I would consider the closest thing to taking a client who is really does not want to get into the weighing, tracking, measuring game, and they want to eat as close to it as intuitive as they can, this is how we would totally. introduce someone to the intuitive type Speaking of Speaking of that, the last one is to journal, is to just keep a journal where you write before and after you eat one or two sentences about how you feel. And it's there's nothing magical about what you write or the fact that you're necessarily writing, but what it does do is it puts you in that executive part of your brain. Whenever you think on paper, you're taking your thoughts, you're moving to the frontal lobe, the executive part of the brain is the part of the brain that thinks things out and is not impulsive. The other parts of the brain can be quite impulsive. And oftentimes, poor eating habits are actually pretty impulsive. And so what they find in studies, and again, this falls under that mindfulness category, when people start journaling and they're told to change nothing else, it typically starts to result in some fat loss, simply because they took a, a minute to write down how they felt, which made them think about how they felt, and now there's some awareness. So you, I've, you've given this advice quite a few times, and I, I've always I've done this with clients, and I have a little bit more like specific what I want, right? And and I've found and why is because I one there's research to show that people are just tracking food not saying they can or can just tracking their food, they eat a certain percentage less also. Mm -hmm. So when I tell them the journal, this is all I tell them, because a lot of times they're like, well, what do I write? Or what am I supposed to, I don't get it. What, how, what am I supposed to be thinking or feeling? It's like, Lizzie, all I want you to do is write down what you ate and how you felt. That's it. Yeah. Every meal, when you sit down, write what it was that you ate mm -hmm. and write how you felt. And just you becoming aware of what you're eating, there's plenty of research to support that tracking what you're eating so will, 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 will result in you eating less food 
and then you attach that yep. to how you're feeling afterwards and you start to connect the dots of like yeah. you build hey, associations yes hey i ate that ice cream so one you're already having to write and track that so that and then you sort of go like oh god i actually felt like shit afterwards like it was yeah. good going down but didn't feel good afterwards and then you start to learn to connect the dots to these when you eat outside of what you know is ideal for you how you truly feel about it and it's easier to resist in the future well i think yeah and another sort of benefit to journal journaling that i'll also like uh, it could be towards other things uh in your life but really what it does is it helps to to get it out of your mind and into the tangible world so it's mm -hmm. like this is a real thing uh and it's not a lot of times we can trick ourselves especially with nutrition totally and just say well i am eating good and i am doing this and yeah. i am like and, and you just you know sort of repeat this you gaslight yourself in a sense yeah. uh and to to be able to write it down and then you can refer to it and it's like this is real this is what's happening i'm present um it just helps you to to, to stay like consciously focused on it. well that's such a good point you're making right now too because the, again lots of research to support this that the average person is what they report under report by like 20 or 30 percent or something mm -hmm. like that like mm -hmm. so you most people totally uh underestimate uh how they eat anyway so simply documenting that brings it into reality and it's no longer this this thing that they've been gaslighting themselves to your point 100 percent. by the way gaslighting is not real <laughs> All right. If you what? want to burn body fat, go to mindpumpfree.com. We have a fat loss guide. It's free. Mindpumpfree.com. You can also find us on Instagram. Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpdestefano. Adam is at mindpumpadam.